Record. Good evening. My name is John Milburn and this is Laws 13010 Evidence and Proof. This is week one of term three 2018 and we have a number of people online. Thank you very much for joining us for the live session. If you're watching this as a recorded um, version of the session, please do consider joining us for the live session every Thursday night during term that is at 7pm Queensland time. Just a note, any times that I nominate on Moodle or otherwise will always be Queensland time. So please make the necessary adjustments. And I know that we've got people from all over Australia and possibly from overseas doing this unit. Welcome and uh, I hope you enjoy the unit. Just before I started to record, I mentioned for those people that are live that for this unit, we will need you to develop your acting skills to some degree because evidence and proof is largely around courtroom material. Much of it is in writing, but there is a component of, of course that is live. So the first assessment, which is the witness examination assessment due on the 20th of December by 11.45 p.m. is a live assessment. And in that assessment, you have the opportunity to cross-examine or examine, so examine or cross-examine a witness and that witness will be played by me. So the idea is that you book in with me, um, two people, so join up with someone in the class, in the unit, and um, one will be the examiner, that is the prosecutor, the other will be the cross-examiner, which is defence counsel. It's a lot of fun, but it's remarkable how long and yet so short, if, if, I can, if you can understand that contradiction, the 15 minutes or so that you're on your feet, so to speak, will be. And what we try to do in that first assessment is create something that is somewhat realistic in that when you are on your feet in a court or tribunal or in an arbitration, you are dealing with issues live. Now, the only difference in real substance between what would happen in practice and what happens in the first assessment is that there will not be any objections to the material. So while your opponent is conducting the examination or cross-examination, even though you may be tempted to um, object to certain questions or lines of questions, um, we're not asking you to do that. And so there's no assessment piece in relation to objection. So that's the main difference. But otherwise, it will be as realistic as we can make it for a trial context. So I do hope that you've had a look at that assessment um, and indeed all the assessments um, and made notes of when the assessment is due. As usual, if you've worked with me in the past, you'll know that I encourage you to plan out your assessment and work backwards so that you're working to a timetable and planning, such a key element. With the reading um, that we ask you to do each week, I do ask that you read in advance as well as uh, for the week in, um, in the session and do have a copy of the um, Evidence Act, Queensland and the Evidence Act, Commonwealth, handy. Now you don't need paper versions. I have the paper versions because I actually use them in court. So I take them with me to court uh, the electronic versions will do you fine. Now, if you have any questions, please ask through the chat facility or please unmute your microphone and um, we'll um, uh, uh, deal with those questions as we go. So Sarah has a question with regard to the assessment. Is it valid to look at the evidence rules to try and get parts of the statement removed or declared invalid? Well, that's a good point. Um, no, no one's ever asked that, but that's a very good point. And in practice, that is exactly what we would do. So this week, for example, I was in court seeking to argue that certain pieces of material um, should be excluded on discretionary grounds in much the same way that Sarah has raised. But no, the answer is no. So don't seek to um, exclude evidence as a preliminary matter. Um, but what you would do is not fall into the traps. Now, just let's speak a bit about that first assessment. One, one of you will examine me to elicit the evidence that I have to give, and the other will cross-examine me. 
Now, I'm just going to ask, just to get you warmed up on the keyboards and get you engaged, what do you think would be easier task? Do you think it would be easier to be the examiner drawing out the evidence or the cross-examiner trying to attack the evidence? Which is easier, examination or cross-examination? Right, so the votes are coming in. Examination, cross-examination, both. Cross-examination, examination, 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 cross-examination. And cross-examination, we're getting a few votes for that. It's pretty close. Um, I think that's almost exactly 50-50. In reality, it is very close. I would say it's slightly more difficult to do examination than cross-examination. But then that might be because most of my work is done in cross-examination um, rather than examination. So to me, it looks harder what the other, my opponent is doing than what I do. Um, but I think it, yeah, it does depend. Now, why on earth would you, you think it would be difficult to do, cross, to, to do examination? It's just a matter of drawing out the evidence, getting them to talk about the evidence. But the, the key is to keep them on track and importantly, not to fall into error by having the witness give evidence which is clearly inadmissible, which in practice may cause a mistrial. So there's a lot, riding, a lot of money riding on these things. If you have a judge, associate, bailiff, court orderlies, legal teams, jurors, a whole jury panel perhaps, witnesses that have had to, to attend a court and as a result of asking a question, a witness responds which causes a mistrial, you can imagine the expense associated with that and the ire of the judge in having a day or three days or a week out of the diary lost because of what happened on day one. Do you understand what I'm getting at? So in practice, you need to tread very carefully and it's, you can't really blame, blame the witness if the witness answers a question as a result of um, the question that you asked. So that applies to both examination and cross-examination. But I think there's slightly more danger in terms of drawing out an inappropriate response, uh, which is inadmissible, if you are examining. Now, that's not to say you should therefore all try to do the cross-examination side of it. We hope that um, some of you will volunteer to be the examiner and some will be the cross-examiner. And I hope you don't mind trying to simply join up with uh, members of your unit to um, complete that task. And then what you do is you book in with me. So from a practical perspective, uh, team up with someone else. It's not a, it's not a group assessment. You're individually assessed. Um, but it's useful if you conduct this process with someone else from the unit. Once you've got someone that you're going to work with, send me an email. Um, yes, so send me an email and I will create a little chart on the front of Moodle. Those of you who have worked with me in ADR will, will know what I mean by this. So I'll create a little chart on the Moodle landing page to say, these are the people that have joined up. Here's who's examining, here's who's cross-examining, and here's the date that they're booked in with me to do the live session. And that will occur, that live session will occur sometime at a convenient time to all of us before the 20th of December. And um, if you've worked with me in the past, you'd be aware that I was always a fan of UCREW as a means of class discussion. The university has discontinued its contract with UCREW. So this unit, for me, all communications through Moodle, you might need to train me a bit on this. Um, but I understand the general discussion is where you chat and the Q&A is where you ask a question and I respond. And on that, if you have a question that you'd like to ask me, then rather than send an email, generally speaking, I'd ask that you put that question in the Q&A section so that my response and indeed any other replies from your colleagues can be available for all of us to consider rather than just one person. Now, I appreciate that I'm jumping between some legal theory and some practical issues, and I hope that's not too confusing. But um, let's see if there are any questions. 
So um, Mary said, having a struggle finding the actual 1957 films for the second assessment. I've had to watch some only to realise that they were not the actual film, but a TV version and not the one required for the assessment. All right. Sorry, Mary, for that inconvenience. Um, don't be overly concerned. I, um, I'll try to be flexible in that. Um, Angela says Google Movies has them. Sarah says Witness for the Prosecutions is on iTunes. Liz says Sanity and JB Hi-Fi Melbourne have them as well. Um, about $10. And what's Google Movies? Yeah, I'm not familiar with Google Movies either. But um, keep looking. I think did I, I'm not sure if I put in some links that may have worked. But if someone finds a link that's suitable, obviously copyright may come into it. But um, we'll try and make that accessible to you. And uh, the reason I offer two is that in the past, people have found that one is more easily found than the other. I think um, Witness for the, oh, sorry, 12 Angry Men was uh, fairly easy to find. Sarah says 12 Angry Men, JB Hi-Fi, $5. So that's pretty good. Um, it's not a bad movie to have in your collection anyway. But if you're really struggling, please let us know. So any questions, comments so far? All good? All right. So um, let's just share the screen for a moment. Have a look at the Moodle page. And I'm sure you're all by this stage very familiar with the layout of Moodle. If you've worked with me, you'll be generally fairly familiar with the way in which I set out the Moodle page. So again, as a reminder, top left hand corner, we have the assessment regimes, the dates, the percentage overall that each assessment is worth. And in this, in this unit, we have an invigilated examination. I don't have the date for that exam yet. It will be in the exam block. It's 40%. It's two hours, open book, um, other than, um, so you can take in any materials other than something that would allow you access to the internet. So um, as usual, you may need to print a lot of material. Just on the exam and assessments generally, I'm going to move down the page to show you the assessment regime. Third block down, just a summary again of the assessments. And I'd ask you to look at this video that I produced earlier this year. You, you may have watched this already if you've worked with me before but it, um, it's a video about what I call level three examination or short window online paper preparation. So in the context of this unit, the um, video is relevant because it's the examination preparation component. And in that, I basically say that the best way to prepare for the examination is to write in advance in some degree uh, of detail note form, a dot point form or otherwise, your intended answers to various questions. Um, you can use that as a base for other units as well. I will just digress for the moment and say that um, there is a level four. I didn't go into level four, but if you watch this video, level four is where you create a block of information that you can use not just for this exam or this assessment, but you can use it generally for other examinations and assessments. And it means being um, very careful with your cataloging. For example, um, it may be that you want to talk about the Brigginshaw standard of proof, not just in this um, unit, but other units as well. So you'll have your material um, where you describe Brigginshaw in an effective way that works for you, pre-written so that in an examination or an assessment piece, rather than having to think on the uh, off the top of your head, what does it mean? How do I access? Look up the index. You'll already have that written. So please keep that in mind as what I've I now describe as level four preparation for the examination. All right. So let's share the screen again, and we'll go back to the assessment regime primarily. So with the assessments. Um, the first one we've described briefly, pair up, send me an email, let me know who your partner is. Maybe um, we can use the Q&A section for this. I might have to create a um, block um, so you can share information that way 
which we would normally do, I would normally do through UCRU, and uh, we'll book in with that assessment. Then for the 24th of January, as we've discussed, please try and find one of those two movies so you can um, provide a response to the questions. And in pre preparing for the examination, um, I think I have given you some past exams. To be honest, the exams in uh, this subject, the written exams are quite simple, quite straightforward. And there we have the examinations as they appeared in 2015, 2016, and 2017. The examination in this, uh, actually I can load up the exam that I wrote for term one in 2018 as well. I will do that. And the exam for this term will be in a similar format to the exam uh, earlier this year. All right, so I'll, I'll load that up. Uh, please look at that and start to prepare for the examination now. If you haven't already looked at other material in relation to assessment and referencing, please do so. And if you've done units with, if you've um, completed units with me in the past, you'll see that um, that information is very familiar from what I've previously provided. Other than that, in terms of the layout for the uh, unit, we have general discussion, Q and A um, for questions and materials, and then each week laid out with the dates and the reading that you need to undertake. So this week, for the week commencing the 5th of November, week one, Principles of Evidence, the um, prescribed reading is chapter one, and there is some additional material, study guide and problems. You may see on that screen some grayed out material that won't be accessible to you, but it's background material for me. The idea is that each week you should complete your response to each of the problems. And thank you to Amelia, Elise and Anthony for having provided a response already. And I see that in relation to Amelia's, we have a reply. So the idea is that as you create your discussion, um, you can add your contribution and also provide a response, a reply to others. So um, in relation to Amelia's contribution, we have um, uh, some excellent work there and a response from Michael. So thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Michael. So that's the idea of what we like, want to see. And it will help you with your learning. Uh, it will help you with your examination preparation. And of course, it will help you to collaborate with your fellow students and engage with me in that process. Now, I will, if I can, go through each of those tutorial problems to some degree during our live sessions, but time sometimes gets away from me. And generally I'll have just the one session, which is the Thursday evening at 7 p.m. And I'll supplement that with some more formal lectures from time to time, but not necessarily every week. And I may refer you to other materials, written and audiovisual, from week to week as well. Um, all right, so any questions so far? Oh, and Liz has put in a Google Play copy and paste. Thank you for that. If you're watching um, this as a, um, a Zoom session, you may not be able to have access to that. But again, um, any information that you've provided that uh, tonight or generally that might assist your colleagues, please do put that into uh, Moodle so that we can all share the information. All right, I know I'm doing a lot of talking. Um, any questions, comments beyond what's in the chat facility so far? All right, we'll keep moving on. And uh, <laughs> um, for this unit, we're dealing with what you need to establish in order to win your case, essentially. Can anyone tell me the difference between facts and information? I know that might seem a bit obscure, but what's a fact and what's information? Angela, any thoughts? Hey. Hey. Um, oh, wait. I've stalled. You've stalled? Okay. I so, remember that what the two definitions are, but I think I just reversed them the wrong way around. Um, a fact okay. is absolutely everything that existed and information is detailed, like drilled down fact. 
Have I got that the wrong way around? No, I think that's right. I what's think that's right. Information and is what's being captured. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, you know, um, now in the year 2018, we have information that is available to us that we did not have in 1958, for example. The facts may have already been there, may have been there in 1958. We just didn't know about them, but now we do. And in the year 2068, there'll be further information available to us based on facts that already exist, but we just don't know them. We can't extract that material. So there's a difference there between, um, and some really good discussions going on in the chat facility. Um, there are some, there's a difference between information and which we know and facts that are out there. Now, what is, yes, so Sarah says, um, like simulations of car speed now versus 30 years ago. All right, so what is evidence, if you like, comparing that to, uh, Angela says, information is a captured fact. That's a good definition. That's great. So information is a captured fact. What is evidence? Sarah says, and I agree with this, information that may be taken to court. All right, good. And also, I mean, what's the, I guess, the first thing that comes to your mind about evidence? Angela says admissible facts might be evidence. So when we go to court, we provide information, which we say is evidence. But what is the, the first thing that comes to mind in terms of what it is? We have real evidence, bullet, for example. Yep, I agree with that. The proof of the truth. Proof of the truth. Okay. So if we went to court in relation to a motor vehicle accident, we may talk to the, we might lead evidence in relation to, I don't know, the population of Venezuela. That's information, but the court will say, What's that got to do with this case? So therefore, the information we provide to the court needs to be, thank you, Marcus, relevant. That's the, that's the first point, isn't it? If it's not relevant to the case, information is of no use to us. So therefore, it's not going to be evidence, is it? It needs to be relevant to the case. Evidence is the information that is relevant to advance in the argument of each party. Exactly. So the idea of evidence is that you're presenting facts, information, facts, that does have a tendency to either prove your case or disprove your opponent's case. So it's got to be relevant, but it's also got to be fair. Now, when I say that it's got to be fair, from a, an evidentiary perspective, what am I talking about? Ah, Anthony's got it. That was, did you read my mind there, Anthony? It was so quick. Admissible. It's got to be admissible. It's got to be fair. So um, if we had a motor vehicle accident case and in the course of trying to prove our case, we led evidence that our opponent was a convicted child sex offender, it's not relevant and it's not fair because what we're trying to do is say, look, we're in the right because this other person is really bad person and therefore you should trust me. And you see, there's a big difference. When people argue, they don't care necessarily about relevance or fairness. Don't you think often arguments are based on you know, the gloves are off, so to speak, in a verbal sense, anything goes. Irrelevant information goes in. Unfair information goes in. Um, hearsay evidence goes in. Uncorroborated material goes in. So what we need to do is strip away the usual unrestrained argument that might occur in the general public and sanitise it by reference to the rules of evidence so that it is both relevant and fair, therefore admissible. Does that make sense? 
our ah yes <laughs> political parties i mean exactly if you look at the floor of parliament it's just full of material that is good it it would never stand up in court um and and it's just it's just completely different to a court situation so yes don't think that you're being arguing in a court is anything like arguing on the floor of uh, of parliament um and sarah said it can't be collected in a way that is not fair to one party, select as in, for example, collected by an undercover police officer, Ridgeway against the Queen. That's a, if you haven't come across Ridgeway, that's a really interesting case to look at. So yes, there are rules of fairness. So for example, we might, as defence in defence in a criminal law matter, seek to raise an argument that certain evidence obtained by the police, although it do, is factual and although it would have a direct bearing on whether the prosecution is successful or not, may have been collected in an unfair or illegal manner to the point where it should be excluded, perhaps on fairness or um, um, uh, other grounds. So it must be legal, says Mary. I agree with that. So when we're talking about evidence, we're talking about something that is relevant and something that is admissible. Now, what that means is, if I'm correct in that statement, it may be that facts are relevant, but the court will never hear about them. The jury will never hear about them. Now, can you give me an example of that? say in a criminal law context, what's a fact that you might say, well, this is very relevant, but you're not allowed to admit it into evidence. So Robert says a coerced confession, um, making a murder a binge watching reference. Marcus, Sarah and Eve all came in almost as a dead heat, criminal history. And that's what I had in mind. It's not always the case. In some jurisdictions, there's talk about change in the evidentiary rules to allow for criminal histories to go before a jury. But the rationale, of course, behind not admitting criminal histories is that whilst it's very relevant, I mean, if someone's charged with burglary and the jury were aware that this person had already been convicted of 10 robbery, uh, you know, um, uh, burglary charges in the last two years, do you think that would have a bearing on their thoughts? I'm sure it would. I'm sure that they would immediately think, well, it's very likely that he or she is guilty because they, this is what they do. So criminal histories can be highly influential, highly relevant, but sometimes, and most of the time, simply not fair. Now, one of the things about this unit that we'll discuss is that the evidence that is provided to a court needs to be relevant and it needs to be admissible, but sometimes it can flick around, flip around again and things that are generally not admissible might become admissible in certain circumstances. So I mentioned criminal history. Most of the time, criminal history or reference to previous crimes is something that is not admissible, but then, and this is probably 99.9% .9 of the time, but then just sometimes it is admissible. So we have this general rule that says only things that are relevant go into evidence. If it's not, um, and, and it's there, and it's also got to be admissible, if it's not admissible, it doesn't go into evidence, but then sometimes we say, yeah, but that's an exception to the general rule about inadmissibility. So now it's starting to get a bit circular and I'm trying not to confuse you, but let's think about, for example, the situation of criminal history. Has anyone read far enough in advance to have some idea of where evidence relating to past crimes may sometimes be admissible before the jury? Sentencing. Sentencing, good thought, Anthony, but bear in mind the distinction between a trial to determine guilt or innocence 
as opposed to the sentencing hearing. So you're right, in a sentence hearing or sentence, um, criminal history is, is always relevant and uh, admissible. But when it comes to a jury determining whether someone is guilty or not guilty, the general rule is they don't get to see or hear about criminal histories, but just sometimes the jury might. Now, Sarah and Marcus, I think, are onto this. So um, Sarah said, it's, if it's not relevant on its own, it can be deemed relevant if it relates to another piece of evidence, perhaps. Marcus has got the words that I'm after, particularly similar fact. So sometimes similar fact, or if you like propensity evidence, of which similar fact is a subset, is admissible into evidence. Now, can you think of, now I know we're talking now about week nine material, but I'm doing this quite intentionally because I'm going to encourage you to, and this is, I always do this, if you've worked with me in the past, you'll know I always do this. It's sort of like comes from statutory interpretation where I say, get the broad principles first, get an overall view of this, and then go back and start to read in detail. A bit like the way you interpret legislation, do you know? So um, with your reading and your excellent textbook, you should always look at all the chapters, get a feel for it, flick through it, do some speed reading at the start to get a feel for it all, and then go back to the start. and It'll make a whole lot more sense. So for example, when we talk about similar fact evidence, as Marcus identified, we're really saying that, and Sarah has explained it this way, when the history factors probative value exceeds the prejudicial effect. Yep, that's the general test. So sometimes a court will say, I'm going to allow the prosecutor to lead evidence of what this person has done in the past as part of the evidence presented to the jury in relation to what this person is alleged to have done now. And we'll read about that and we'll go into it in more detail, but it really comes down to this. If what is in the person's past is so similar, so unique to show a course of events that logically must have made it more likely that this person did this event now, then the court may allow it into evidence. You know, like, do you, do you ever watch those movies about serial killers? How, and so, or, or even if you go back further, I don't know, Batman and, and all the villains in Batman and the TV shows. People had, they had their little way of doing things, didn't they? Because their, their MO, their trademark, if you like. So sometimes people who were committing crimes had just such a unique way of doing things that, and were convicted of these things in the past, that the courts have said, okay, this has all the hallmarks of this almost unique MO that we're going to allow it in as evidence now in relation to the current case. So have a look at evidence of a crime with particular MO as criminal history match the current case. And a good place to start is the Crown against Fennig, P-H-E-N-N-I-N-G. And thank you, Sarah, for that one. Michael says Dexter. I'm not familiar with Dexter. I should be, but I'm not. Christie is another case, but it's more general. It's not so much similar fact evidence. It's um, to do with a general discretion. Okay, so have I confused you completely? I, no one has dropped out. We're, we're right. But you know what I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to get you to think about the bigger picture in this unit to do a lot of reading in advance and hit it hard in the first week or two. And then when you go back and you start to read in more detail, it will make much more sense. And I do like to jump around. So keep you on your toes. Okay, any questions, comments? I'm really pleased to see that everyone is hanging in there and I can see that you're all paying attention. That's good. Okay, in terms of um, textbook material, I've mentioned the prescribed text, Queensland Evidence Law by Field. That's the fourth edition. If you have the third edition, that's fine. It'll still serve you well. The fourth edition, of course, is um, 
more up to date and has some information. The page references, if I do provide page references, relate to the fourth edition, so you're just going to have to work it out for yourself if you're using the third edition. But it's an excellent text. Um, in terms of other material that you might want to consider, one that I think is really very good, and I know it's expensive, but if the but if your interest is such that you're uh, keen to to learn more, and uh, and you're keen to, uh, to to do have a lot of material, this is an excellent text. So this is Evidence Law in Queensland, South Australia, and Western Australia, and uh, that is by Hemming and Layton. Thomson Reuters, an excellent test text. Um, just coming into its 12th edition, I've got the 11th edition of... Sorry, just on yes, that, I've got that book you just had. Yes, Michael. WA. So what week should we be reading on this when we're doing the, the weeks and the other? Because I've got that and I was looking at... Oh, you do? Read. Yeah, chapter curious. one. Yeah. yeah, so I should just follow week to week, roughly speaking? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yep. and, and I'm reluctant to actually put it into Moodle because that will make people feel that they've got to buy the text and I'm trying to avoid that to save you some money. So um, uh, I hope that makes sense. Sure, I bought this one by accident and just realised I don't have the other one and I've got to buy the other one, hence I have this Oh, one. okay, yeah. <laughs> well, look, you can, you can actually get by with, without the prescribed text if you have this one, um, but um, it would, it's, it's easier probably to have the prescribed text. Um, but it is a really, really good book. Uh, another one which I think is excellent but slightly more technical um, by Dr. Forbes is Evidence Law in Queensland. That's um, one that is very well regarded. That's up to its 12th edition now. And um, other than that, there is a workbook. It's called Rules of Evidence. This was the prescribed supplementary text previously. It's still very good, Aronson and Bargerick. So there's a lot of good text. If you were buying four texts, the ones that I've shown you are the ones that I would get. Um, all right, so we'll provide you with the reading from the prescribed text. The aim is for you to read, as I said, in arrears and in advance. I'm going to invite you to create your own little dictionary because sometimes the terms seem to be interchangeable and it's best if you come up with your own definitions of things. We've talked about a few tonight, information and facts, admissibility, we've talked about briefly, probative value, prejudicial um, effect. So you need to keep in mind these ideas and maybe come up with a, um, a little definition. So information means facts provided or learning about something or someone and information is different to um, facts, which is different to evidence. And um, for evidence, the, the key points of these, it needs to be number one, relevant. If it's not relevant, forget it. Doesn't even make its way into the possibility. Number two, it needs to be admissible. So we've talked about both those things tonight. But it, we do go beyond that into a three and a four. And we touched on four earlier. Number three is reliable. It needs to be have a degree of reliability. So it might be relevant. It might be admissible. But then it may not be terribly reliable. And number four is its probative value. So it's kind of a pecking order of evidence. Um, number one, if it's not relevant, it's not going to get in. Number two, if it's not admissible, it's not going to get in. Number three, if it's not reliable, it'll get in, but it won't carry much weight. And number four is this general probative effect, which is very similar to, to reliability in, in the sense of to what degree can you rely upon it. So <clears throat> keep those things in mind as you're reading the material, because you need to be clear about the basis upon which you're either saying this evidence should not be presented, or if it is presented, why one shouldn't consider it very uh, with much weight. Now, can anyone give me an idea or an example of what might be relevant, what might be admissible, but not particularly reliable evidence? 
anything come to mind? All right, so Elise says, oral evidence from a drunk or drug addict. Excellent, yes. That might be perfectly um, valid material, but the question is, how much can you really rely upon this person who was drunk when they said that they witnessed this event? Others, um, email evidence, witnesses that had something, however criminal or druggy, yep. Hearsay is coming in a bit um, as an option and friends of the plaintiff. Okay, mentally unstable people. So let's pick up on Michael's idea, friends. So you might say, yes, this person saw the event and was sober at the time, but it's this person's cousin. Can you really rely upon the evidence of someone's cousin? I think sometimes that's overstated, but it's a point that might be considered. Now, hearsay is slightly different because the argument about hearsay evidence is, yes, it's not reliable, but does it meet the second test? Is it admissible? You see, so hearsay, if it passes the admissibility test and gets into evidence, then of course you're going to you're going to argue about whether it's reliable or not. But I'm not sure it would necessarily pass the second test. Um, Mary raises a good point. What about a co-defendant? Can you rely upon the evidence of a co-defendant? Um, and I like Eve says. I feel bad suggesting this, but maybe children. I think that's right um, because you know, depending on the age of the child or the level of maturity, maybe you can't. Um, reliably consider that evidence. But I do like that you raise the point, I feel bad about this because it raises in my mind a situation that had I asked that question 20, 30 years ago in a course like this, I reckon somebody would have said um, a person who made a late complaint and that be reliable. So in a case involving an allegation of sexual assault or rape, um, uh, to, to take a more extreme example of sexual assault, if the complainant makes the complaint three months after the event, three years after the event, or 30 years after the event, the question may come to your mind, is that reliable evidence? because it comes in so late. Now we have special particular rules. I won't go into it any more than that because we'll talk about that during the unit, but they're the sorts of things that people might consider within the context of reliability. And of course, you, just to give you a heads up, in terms of um, uh, complaints that are made 30 years ago, they are just as admissible um, as they would be had they been made the, the day before. Of the day of the day of the event. PTSD could prevent claiming earlier. Um, recent um, sexual celebrity assault cases comes to mind as well, says Sarah. Okay, so in this unit, what we're going to do is we're going to apply primarily statutory rules of evidence. I showed you previously the Evidence Act of Queensland and the Evidence Act, that's 1997, and the Evidence Act Commonwealth, which is 1995. So they're the two pieces of primary, the two primary pieces of legislation. The statutory rules, of course, are contained within that legislation. However, we'll also consider the common law and we'll consider the difference between the evidentiary rules that apply in Queensland-based litigation as opposed to Commonwealth-based legislation. Mary raises a really good point. Will we need to print those for the exam? Unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to say you, you should. And I think you should print the entire piece of legislation. I know it's, I, I think I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this. My personal view is that you, I can examine you much better 
if we had an online exam, we had access to the electronic material and it saves a whole lot of paper. And we don't have to have issues of people handwriting and memory and things like that. But it is an invigilated examination. That's what's prescribed, so that's what we do. And I think you will need the, um, the act. Now, you may get away with summaries. So if you're the sort of person that can work well off summaries of the legislation, then feel free to do that. So in this unit, now probably mostly it will be Queensland, but I can't say that it's exclusively Queensland. So therefore you need to consider the Commonwealth. And part of the reason I say that is that um, as we'll learn during this unit, the Queensland Evidence Act, which is somewhat similar to um, the situation in South Australia and Western Australia is different, very different to New South Wales and Victoria, Tasmania, because in those states, the Uniform Evidence Act, which is based on the Commonwealth Act, applies. So if you were doing this unit in New South Wales, you would really only have the one piece of legislation to consider, which is based around the Commonwealth legislation. But in Queensland, we have two quite different pieces of legislation. Historically, that's been the case. I'm not sure if it will continue, but it is as we go. And Liz says, maybe cheaper to purchase than print them off. And I reckon there's a lot to that, Liz. Um, I forget where I source these printed versions, but I was surprised that they were really good value. Um, and it's a very convenient way to go. But most of the, the legislation that you need, or at least referred to, will be in your textbook as well. So there is that option. I'm sorry that's a bit vague, that response. So we'll be talking about the statutory rules. We'll talk about the common law rules. We'll talk about state, Queensland state, and we'll talk about the, the um, Commonwealth. You, of course, need always to consider ethical challenges in relation to evidence. So keep that in mind. Michael says he bought the Western Australian Act for about $30. Um, you need to analyse the admissibility issue always. So you're always thinking about whether this is admissible or not. And then if it is admissible and it goes in, you're talking about its reliability, its probative value. How much can you rely upon it? In answering any question, you need to consider the statute first, I think, and then talk about the common law and the cases that relate to it. Um, are any questions so far? We're all good? All right. Now, from your previous studies, I'm sure that you're aware of the difference between the burden of proof and the standard of proof. If not, please brush up on that. And in terms of um, the burden of proof in criminal law cases, just remember that it will bounce around a bit so and it will change. So in a criminal law case, for a serious or indictable offence, which is dealt with by way of indictment, it will typically go through a committal process. The burden there at the committal is simply if there's enough evidence that a jury properly instructed may find the person guilty. So it's a very low standard of proof at a committal. But once it gets through permittal, uh, prima facie, says Marcus quite correctly, that is the test, prima facie. Once it gets through the committal and it's before a judge with a jury, um, then we're talking about beyond reasonable doubt. Or if a magistrate is dealing with the matter, the same test applies. If that is, if it's at the hearing or the trial, beyond reasonable doubt. So that's the burden um, with, for prosecution, which, is, which provides for different standards of proof, um, depending on whether it's a committal or a trial. Now, bear in mind that there is some burden of proof on a defendant in some circumstances in criminal law cases. Can anyone tell me where there might be a burden imposed on defence in a criminal law case? I found it interesting like um, that all people are judged to be sane or whatever unless they can prove otherwise. But people who have truly got a mental health issue or whatever makes it a bit hard on them. It does. That's, and it's a really good point. So, and a few people raise that insanity. Uh, there is a, correctly, you've identified there's a reverse onus when it comes to insanity. And the person who alleges insanity 
must prove the insanity. And you would, and logically you're thinking, well, you know, that's a really hard thing to do. And if you are generally suffering, as Angela says, a mental illness, how do you go about proving it? In Queensland, we have a slightly different procedure to other states in that we have both a mental health court um, and a mental health review tribunal jurisdiction. So I'm a member of the mental health review tribunal. Um, but what happens in the mental health court? Does anyone know? And this is in the context of a defendant um, who says, I am insane or not fit for trial. What happens there? The charges are dismissed, potentially, yes. Can't read the cases. Um, what happens is that um, usually a lawyer or someone else will instigate the proceedings on behalf of that person to take the matter to the mental health court and the mental health court makes a determination in relation to fitness for trial um, and um, will make a determination. Now, as a result of that, the court may find that the person is not guilty due to effectively insanity, but it's not, um, that's not the end of it because very often the court will also make a finding in relation to um, a forensic order, which means that the person, although found to be of unsound mind or unfit for trial, and therefore is not going to be dealt with at law um, through the, the criminal law process, is now subject to a forensic order, and that forensic order can remain with that person for many years. And in fact, depending on the severity of the um, forensic order and the nature of the crime, the level of illness that person might be uh, placed into what is effectively detention um, through the forensic order. And then the Mental Health Review Tribunal um, routinely and regularly reviews that forensic order uh, once made by the Mental Health Court. Now I've digressed a bit, but does that make sense? So that there is that reverse onus in relation to insanity. What other, are there any other instances that you can think of where there's a reverse onus in a criminal law trial where the defendant is required to prove something? Oh, the Bur Burke Street murderer was found to be of sound mind. I didn't realize that. Thank you, Liz. Um, Elise says the woman who killed seven children in Cairns a few years ago went to the mental health court. Mental health court is surprisingly busy jurisdiction. So we're talking about reverse onus where the defendant has to prove something. Mary and Robert almost together said drugs. Yep, there's some degree of truth in that. Um, in the sense that if you are the occupier of a premises, drugs are there, then you may be deemed to have um, a possession of those drugs. So you may need to establish that you did not know or reasonably suspect that the drugs were there. Keith says battered wife syndrome, maybe, maybe. Um, so where we have the re another reversal situation is in relation to what we call the evidentiary onus regarding some defences. Let me give you this example. So the prosecution brings evidence before the court that someone assaulted another. The defendant says, look, I assaulted that person, but I was provoked or I acted in self-defense. In order for that to be dealt with, the defendant needs to overcome an evidentiary uh, onus of at least proving some evidence to that effect. Um, in other words, once they've established almost like a prima facie defence, then it's up to the prosecution to bring evidence to overcome that defence to beyond all reasonable doubt. But it's up to the defendant to at least raise the defence and show something which the prosecution needs to then act upon and reject. Anthony's got a great visitor with him. Now, does that all make sense? I know that might be a bit confusing, but the point that I'm trying to make is that whilst in introduction to law, we make it sound all very simple. You know, the 
burden of proof is on prosecution and prosecution needs to establish beyond reasonable doubt. In this unit, we're becoming more advanced and we, we have to talk about some of the nuances in relation to the burden and standard of proof, both in the context of criminal law and civil law. And Mary says, no case to answer, yes. So sometimes you can raise an argument as defense to say the evidence which is presented is um, not sufficient to warrant this to go to a jury and therefore there is no case to answer. That's a different slightly, that's a different test. But um, yep, that's along those lines. Now in civil law, and I'm sorry I'm taking so long, but in civil law, um, the standard of proof is uh, on the balance of probabilities. We all know that. But, and I've alluded to this already this evening, is there a little, is there a bit of nuance about that? The sliding scale, says Liz, yes. And what's that sliding scale all about? And what's another name for the sliding scale? The Brigginshaw test. Brigginshaw test, exactly. And um, here's my version of Brigginshaw. And uh, this is what I stand by this. Brigginshaw does not mean that there is a different standard of proof. It's always on the balance of probabilities. In my view, Brigginshaw doesn't change that. It's still balance of probabilities. But Brigginshaw, even though we talk about a sliding scale, and it's very common, and that's true, doesn't mean that instead of 50%, it's now 60% or 70% or anything like that. Some people say that. I don't subscribe to that view. I still say it's balanced probabilities. It's just that depending on the level of importance or significance of the decision being called upon to answer, the better, more cogent um, evidence is required. I'll give you an example. If you're in front of the QCAT in its minor civil disputes jurisdiction and you're arguing over $2,000 car repair, then maybe the um, adjudicator hearing the matter might be satisfied with a, a bit of evidence. You don't need that much. All right, you've got some evidence. I'm satisfied with that. Yep, that's good enough. I'll make the order. But what if you're talking about a $2 million case in the Supreme Court? It's still on the balance of probabilities, but if you come along to the Supreme Court with a little bit of evidence, not much, and there's likely a whole body of evidence out there that you, didn't, you haven't brought to the court, the court is likely to say, I'm not satisfied that I can make that order on this evidence. It's too important a matter. You've got to bring better evidence than that. The test is still on the balance of probabilities, but Brigginshaw says um, that the court is entitled to receive a better standard of evidence. That's my version of it. If you have a different view, please let me know, and I'm open to ideas um, and other interpretations. And I know that some people do say their version of Brigginshaw is that um, the balance, of, that the test goes from being on the balance of probabilities to somewhere close to beyond reasonable doubt. And I'm not sure that's right. Anyway, um, we'll see how we go. And if you come up with something different, please let me know about that. Now, having confused you, um, let me summarize briefly what I've attempted to do this evening. What I've attempted to do primarily is to encourage you to look at the assessment pieces, make sure that you've got diary notes as to when these things are to occur, make sure that you've booked out time for the examination if you can, things of that nature. In other words, planned, uh, you've looked ahead and you've planned by, by looking backwards. That's number one. Number two, that you're aware of the legislation that you need to look at now and become very familiar with during the course of this unit and become familiar with your textbook and maybe if you want to, some of the other supplementary texts. That's number two. Number three is I want you to be aware of some of the definitions that you're likely to come across and start to create your own list, things that make sense to you. And you can use this for your exam. This is all part of exam preparation. So you've got a clear idea in your mind as to what you mean by fact or probative value or weight or admissibility. So you're starting to build your own definitions and catalogue it. 
And sometimes it's best if you just do this for yourself in a way that makes sense for you. That's number three. Number four is I want you to think about the process of providing or proving your case. And that means having a very clear understanding of who has the burden of proof and what is the standard of proof and how does that all change in different circumstances and start to create for yourself a little list of um, what these things mean at least to you and provide some examples as well. So I hope that all makes some sense. Um, and I encourage you to read ahead as much as you can. And Liz says, this is a really good um, question. Thank you, Liz. Is plain English law writing okay? Absolutely. I think with me, you probably know that I um, value simplicity in writing and clarity in writing. You're not going to get marks from me for convoluted um, sentences that contain legalese. In fact, you might lose some marks. You know what I mean by legalese, don't you? All right. Good. Thank you very much for your patience this evening. Um, any questions before we sign off? All good? Okay. Well, I'll end the meeting now. I'll upload this to YouTube um, and, and then to Moodle. And we'll see you next week. Thank you all for attending. Bye then.